Advent wreath, the candles of hope, peace, and joy. Now we light the fourth candle of Advent. This is the candle of love. Jesus demonstrated self-giving love in his ministry as the good shepherd. Even our culture thinks of Christmas as a time of kindness, thinking of others and sharing with others. And those are all good things, but it is best spent thinking about how God loves us by giving us his most precious gift and how we respond to that love. Since God is love, let us all so love others and the blessed we can. 1 John 4, 9 through 11 says, In this the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the proper... Thank you, propitiation for our sins. <laughs> <laughs> Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, teach us to love like you. May we know your love so well that we can't help but display your love first in our lives. As we pre prepare for our celebration of Jesus' birth, also fill our hearts with love for the world that all may know your love and the one whom you've sent, your Son, our Savior, in Jesus' name. Amen. World. Oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel. That mourns in lonely exile here until the Son of God appear. O oh, come, thou day spring, come and cheer our spirits by the God, our help. 
heavenly Father, a blessed angel came, and unto certain shepherds brought tidings of the same. How that in Bethlehem was born the Son of God by name. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy, comfort and joy. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy. Now to the Lord sing praises, all you live in this place. And with true love and brotherhood, each other now embrace. Tide of Christmas, all others stopped in fight. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy, comfort and joy. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy. Oh, the deep, deep love of Jesus, vast That he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Holy night, the stars are brightly shining. It is the night of a dear Savior's birth.
Father God, we are excited to be able to just have the freedom and be here this morning. Uh, we're thankful for how you love each one of us and that you gave your life for us. We uh, come this Christmas time and just want to know that uh, we are celebrating you and not the other things around us. Uh, we ask that you would have your spirit with us this morning as Matt preaches and teaches us. And God, we ask that our uh, words of our mouth and the meditations of our heart be acceptable in your sight. This morning we pray. Amen. Thanks, Joe. What a great encouragement. To... Yeah, Joyce was the uh, first person at this church that I ever prayed with. Um, and she sought me out to pray with me. It was before, uh, it was actually at the Dunkel's old place. Um, and uh, she said, well, before we go in, and she was in her wheelchair, before we go in, let's pray. And uh, it made a huge impact on me. So great, great story about Joyce. Uh, those of you that knew her, she was a wonderful woman. Well, today we lit the love candle, and uh, we read First John as we did that. And uh, while that isn't a traditional Christmas passage, it's important uh, to the Christmas story because it, it helps to outline the reasons and purpose for Christmas as we look into this. And the reason and purpose for God with us is love. Ultimately, foundationally, it is God's love that brings about Christmas, that drives ultimately Christ to the cross at Easter. So we live, though, in a, day, in a world today that, can I be just frank, is very confused about love, just as a general rule. We, and I've said this before, I've used this illustration before, we say things like, I love tacos, 
with the same mouth as I love my dog or I love my kids or I love you. And what does that mean really in the long run when we really think about it? We never really give those phrases much thought. Are tacos and your kids on the same level? Is that what we mean by that? And maybe, maybe that is why there is confusion for organizations like PETA, who has so famously published A Pig is a Dog is a Boy. Maybe they don't understand the difference between those levels of love and the levels of personhood that are in, inherent within a boy versus, say, a taco. Maybe they don't understand that. And so if I say I love tacos, well, that is the same as saying I love my son, so a taco is a dog, is a boy, maybe, to them. But even the most cursory examination of how we really live in the world gives proof to the lie about that, right? Nobody gives time to hear a taco out, right? The taco comes to you and says, I really just need to unload. No, no. Obviously not. So we are saying there's a difference between I love tacos and I love my wife, obviously. And nobody counsels a dog on how to plan out their life strategy in the trajectory of their life to achieve their maximum potential, as I do with my kids, potentially. So we are confused. Mostly, we fail to understand this very simple principle. There is a moral way to live, an ethical way to live, and there is a wise way to live. And, moral and eth- morality and ethics inform wisdom, but they aren't the sum of wisdom. For instance, there are a number of things that are wise to do that have nothing to do with moral. They're all right. Whatever decision you make, it's right. It's okay to do it. And there are things within that that are wise, and there are things that are not wise. But it's not morally wrong to do the not wise thing. It's just not wise, right? So how do we know? How does, what informs our wisdom in that sense? There's, there are many areas in life where there isn't really a wrong choice. So I can, for instance, love my dog. That's not wrong to love my dog. But it's not wise to put my dog on the level of my kids, and that probably is a moral issue too. I don't know. We have to think about that one. But love... Is and how we show it is often in that realm of wisdom and not morality. How we show love is often in the realm of it's all good, right? It's all morally okay, acceptable in the various ways that we show love, with some exceptions, but it's not all wise all the time. So we say things like, uh, if you love me, you will, and then fill in the blank, right? But do we truly understand ourselves enough, or even the person who's doing the loving of us enough, or even love enough, do we understand it enough, to be able to fill in that blank, to know what it means to say, if you love me, you'll do these things? Some in our culture, some in our world, some of us maybe in this room, believe that love is a feeling. But if you have lived long enough, you know that's not true. You understand how fickle and sometimes how wrong your feelings were throughout the years. Our culture also confuses lust with love and does so quite regularly, which has caused no end of problems emotionally, physically, relationally, spiritually within our culture. Here's the thing that I believe about love. You really, you will not really make it in life at all unless you understand and get really good at choosing, you have to choose, forging, and keeping, maintaining loving relationships. So it's not something that's passive, it's not something that you receive and then uh, all is good in your life, although that's how Hollywood makes it seem. It's not something that's a physical encounter, although... Hollywood goes there quite often as well. It's not even a temporary thing. If you want success in life, you will become good, and this is where wisdom comes in, you will become good at choosing, forging, and keeping loving relationships. Now, we probably understand the unique necessity of being loved, 
We want that for ourselves. We're selfish creatures. We want love. But how do we know when we are loved? How do we know that we've cultivated the right things in our relationships? How do you measure love, for instance? How do you know when someone loves you? Because they tell you they do? Mm. Love, if I can propose this to you, is most clearly seen in action and in truth. When it's actually born out, when it's lived out in our lives. So what are those actions and truths that actually show love? And what are we talking about when we're even talking about love to begin with? We've gone around this barn and we're back to where we started. Are we talking about a love that's filled with physical passion? Are we talking about the kind of love that a family has for each other? Or, or maybe we're talking about that affection that is so clearly displayed in that HBO series about easy company of the 101st Airborne, the band of brothers, that brotherly kind of love. Is that what we're talking about? Or, or do we, when we say, if you love me, you will... Are we talking about something that transcends all of that, that sacrifices and builds into each other so that we can all be what we were intended to be? Those are the four kinds of love that I just went through that are described in the Greek language, which the English language does a terrible job. We talked about this before. The English language just calls it all love, that it's all the same. It's all lumped into one kind of pot, and we just got to figure out what it is we're talking about in the context. But, but there's no confusion in the Greek about it. In the Greek, there are four ways to state this crazy little thing called love. <laughs> there is eros, there is storge, there's phileo, and there's agape right? Passion, romance, desire. When most people talk about love in our modern society, they're describing eros. The eros love is the love of Song of Solomon, if you're familiar with that book. And think about the amount of movies that you see that try to depict love. And where do they go first? But the eros side of it, the physical attraction if you were to classify Hollywood's movies you would, into the, what, the ways that they describe love, you would have a huge pile for the Eros pile and small piles for familial love because, love, you know, families are often shown in movies and depicted in movies and brotherly love a much smaller pile because we don't really go there. And why does Hollywood go that way? Because, well, Eros love sells. That's true. Our society is more interested in the passion and the relationships based on physical attraction. It's easy to tell when you're physically attracted to somebody. The music industry, same issue. Hit after hit talks about that passion, right? I don't have to even give you a genre. Every genre of music has that passionate encounter described within the music. And it's easy to see. And if we were to separate it into piles, again, we would have a huge pile Develop, you know, devoted to the Eros kind of love, and I think maybe a few country music songs would be about family, and that's about it, really, when we, when we get down to it. And there's a place, though, for it. Eros love isn't bad. For instance, you wouldn't exist unless it was for Eros love. But that love can't in that that I'm sorry that kind of love, while it can encompass sex, it can't be replaced by it. And that's the problem. There's no depth. And that's where the world's view is based. It's based on this arrow love and eros love and it derails. It's based on the physical attraction and the average person says that that physical attraction has to happen first. We have to know whether or not we have a physical chemistry to find out whether or not we can go any further in this relationship, which is exactly backwards. And then we can make it work. But no, it actually won't work if you go that route. Why? Well, just think about a singles club, right? Person walks into a singles club, and the first thing that they do is they're cataloging who is potentials in that room, right? You instantly have counted out 80% of the room the moment you walked into a club because they don't physically attract you. You may have discounted the people that would suit you the best, right? But you did it all based on the physical attraction in a singles club. But if you were able to walk into that club and see the 80-year-old self of every single person in that club, the average person going into that club would leave with no one, 
right? Because we go into that club looking for that physical gratification. Eros is not a lasting love. Something else has to fill in to that physical passion. When that physical passion eventually wears out, and it does for all of us, some of us have it longer than others, but it all ultimately peters out, and something else has to take its place. And it may, that thing that takes its place, if it's authentic and true and real, may also drive some of that Eros love for us later in our relationships, but it isn't the other way around. The world knows, the world knows that that's not the only kind of love, it, and, it, and it's aware that there has to be something deeper, but it doesn't like to talk about it. There is familial love, and the world is quick to jump on that one because that's one that's really obvious and doesn't really require anything of me. After all, uh, storge love, the familial love in the Greek, looks different for every family. So nobody can tell me what my familial love ought to look like as opposed to your familial love. And some hug and hold each other's and others exhibit it through acts of service. Some clans communicate love in such a way that it may not even look like love to someone outside of that family. I'm thinking of the mother who's constantly sniping at the son and getting him to eat something, and she's not doing it in nice ways. And you go, is that really love? And yes, that's her way of saying I love you, right? The best thing about family love is that a family will generally stick with you, right? They'll stick with you through adversity. In fact, we see that in Scripture. We'll look at that in just a little bit. But and that's a good thing. We're starting to get on the right track in terms of the kinds of love that are important and, and the, the kinds of things that will drive us in our lives. But it's not the be-all and end-all of love. Storge love is not. Familial love. It's reserved for those people that we often didn't choose in our lives. And because we didn't choose them, sometimes we can't stand them, <laughs> right? They're, they're, they're in our lives because of that biological connection. And if we're really honest, the way that that kind of love is given and received in families is probably more responsible than any of the other forms of love for the sagging psychiatric couches in our culture, Right? Because we expect that that love is going to be something higher, but it ends up being just a love that does just enough to keep the relationship going. Let's get on to the next form, the more happy stuff. Let's get on to phileo love. Now we're talking love, right? You've probably had friends, I think we've all had friends who were willing to speak truth into your life. Maybe not that many, but here and there, there have been friends in your life that have been willing to speak truth into your life. Or the kind of friend that accepts the challenge that you offer them whenever it calls on you, right? Something, some challenge comes up in your life and you reach out to your friend and say, I need your help. And they just are there. They come running when called. That's the brotherly love, and that's, we call it brotherly love, but it's not a male thing. I see it probably most often displayed in female relationships than in male relationships. Anyone can have that kind of, of bond, but it's not quite the complete kind of love that we are really seeking after. And we know that it wasn't quite what Jesus was asking Peter when he asked him, do you love me? Peter would say, yes, yes, I phileo love you. I love you with a brotherly affection. I love you. If you ask me anything, I will be there, Jesus. You just tell me what you need me to do, and I'll do it for you. I phileo love you. But it stops just short of the complete love that's in our passage this morning. As long as we're heading in the same direction, as, as long as our purposes and values are congruent, then yes, I love you with a phileo love. It's really good. It might even be sacrificial as long as you're all on the same page about what you're sacrificing for. But it's not the ultimate. If you've spent a minute in church, you know that there's another level that needs to be examined in this whole discussion of love, and that love is the love that knows no boundary. It is not constrained by attraction or familial ties. It's not even constrained by reciprocation and the bond of friendship. 
It doesn't have anything to do with you heading in the, right, in the same direction or having the same values. And that's agape love. It takes into account all of the other forms of love and then goes beyond them. Agape love only originates from one source. That's what Scripture tells us. And so it says far more about the giver than it does about the receiver. Agape love is other-centered without making objects or idols out of them. It seeks the best for others without concern about what it takes back and receives back. As Thomas Merton says, our job is to love others without stopping to inquire whether or not they are worthy. That is not our business. In fact, it is nobody's business. If you are the receiver of agape love, it isn't your business even whether or not you are worthy. That's what Thomas Merton is saying. What we are asked to do is to love, and this love itself will render both ourselves and our neighbors worthy. So within that, may I give you four criterion of this kind of love? And if you're following in your outline and you're only filling in blanks in your outline, you are going to be seriously deficient in your notes today. I'm just telling you. Um, the four criterion are not in your notes. The four criterion for this kind of love are constancy, carefulness, candor, and counsel. Oh, yes. Alliteration. Isn't it a wonderful thing? Constancy, carefulness, candor, and counsel. First, constancy. Look at the guidance that Proverbs 17:17 17, 17 gives. A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. A friend loves at all times. It doesn't matter if you're going through adversity. It doesn't matter if you have self-doubt or, or if you're being difficult. A friend is there for you at all times. They still love you. They are constant. They're consistent in that but note that it says in the second phrase, and a brother is born for adversity. A brother is born for adversity. In other words, it's an interesting clause. In the ESV and in the NIV, it says and. But in other translations, it says but. We don't really know how to translate that word. It's interpretive. If it is but, then it changes the whole meaning of that, right? But a brother is born for adversity. In other words, when adversity happens, your familial love kicks in and people stand around you, right? That's what family is for, to stand around you in the midst of adversity. They have to. That's what families do. But if it's and, then it's saying, yes, the friend that stands with you is like your brother, but even more so. Because they're with you in all times, including adversity. And they choose to love you even when it's hard. Look at Proverbs 18, 24, and that seems to reinforce this idea. A man of many companions may come to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. A friend who chooses to stick with you is a friend that is closer than a brother. Companions are those who stick with you when you've got it going well. Those are your companions, right? And if you're a person who has it going well, you know this. You have to beware about those relationships. When you have a lot to offer, people will think that you are there for them when you have a lot to offer. But as soon as all of that, lot, that muchness goes away, what happens to them? See, companions dissipate. They disappear. As soon as you no longer have anything to offer them, they go away. That's a companion. But there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. There's one who loves at all times, and they are closer than a brother. Why? Because they choose to stick with you. They aren't obligated to. That's consistency. The second criterion was carefulness. And look at Proverbs 25, 20. Whoever sings songs to a heavy heart is like one who takes off a garment on a cold day and like vinegar on soda. <laughs> I love Scripture sometimes. So descriptive. Right? If, you, if, if somebody is going through something difficult and you're really going through it, a friend doesn't pass off whatever you're going through and say, get over it. Oh, you're so, this is not that big of a deal. Oh, yeah, yeah. Or, or imagine this one. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I've been through that before. That's not right. You'll get over it. It'll be fine. When you're in the middle of that situation, that's not good counsel. That doesn't help you. That's like being laid bare in the midst of the cold. So a good friend doesn't minimize what you're going through. That kind of person is harsh and reactionary, right? Like vinegar on soda. 
Look at Proverbs 26, 18. It says, like a madman who throws firebrands and arrows and death is a man who deceives his neighbor and says, I was only joking. A person who loves you isn't about throwing around words. That's a madman. You've you probably all had the kind of relationship where a person makes cutting remarks to you about you, right? They cut you to the quick, and then when you reveal that you were hurt by what they said, oh, I was just kidding. I'm sorry that you took that seriously. Have you ever experienced that? Have you ever done that to somebody? Preaching to myself. No, someone who loves you chooses their words carefully. They aren't choosing carefully so that they don't trap themselves. That's not why they're choosing themselves carefully. They're choosing their words carefully because they want to build you up. They only want to say what will help. Ephesians 4.29 is on our refrigerator, not because I put it there, but because my wife did, who she who is much more wise than I am, says this, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. So, Love is constant, and love is careful. It doesn't just throw around words. The third thing is, love is candid, though. Oh, yeah, it's careful, but it's also candid. Those who love will relate to us with candor. Candor is honesty and forthrightness. Hmm. Proverbs 25, 5 through 6 says, Better is open rebuke than hidden love. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Profuse are the kisses of an enemy. The NIV says an enemy multiplies kisses. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Why? Because they have your best interest at heart. And while it may hurt, you know it's for your good if they chose their words carefully. The problem in our culture today is that we think someone is a friend if they affirm whatever I want to believe about myself. If I want to think of myself as a goldfish or pick your pronoun, it doesn't really matter, well, then you're a good friend if you tell me that that's good, that I should want that for myself. That's not what a good friend is. That's not even love. But our culture says that it is. The the proverb is telling us that an enemy is the one who provides kisses when what you need is a righteous word in your life. They'll do what feels good for you, but they won't do anything that is good for you. A friend will wound you when it's necessary to show you the truth. Well, that can't be friendship, can it? Yes, it is. Look at the first line of that verse again in verse 5. It indicates that hiding that kind of love, the love that wounds in order to help, that really isn't love at all if you're hiding it. Love is constant, careful, candid, and love brings counsel when it's necessary. Look at these three Proverbs. Proverbs 27, 17 says, iron sharpens iron and one man sharpens another. Proverbs 28, 23 says, whoever rebukes a man will afterward find more favor than he who flatters with his tongue. Why is that? Because Proverbs 29, 5 says, a man who flatters his neighbor spreads a net for his feet. If you think you're helping someone by only telling them what what they want to hear, or if you think that someone loves you when they're telling you what you want to hear, you haven't understood love. Sorry. Flattery, telling what someone wants to hear, isn't love. It's not. It's a net. It trips us up at best. At its worst, it entraps us. It's a snare. And love doesn't seek to ensnare someone ever. If you really want to show that you love, then what you'll do is that first proverb. You'll grind down the hard edges. You'll see through their rough spots. You'll tell the truth about them. If you want love, not flattery, then you'll surround yourself with people who will do the same for you. Whoever walks with the wise becomes wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. We want to walk with the wise, don't we? So those are the things that love is. Love is constant, careful, candid, and brings wise counsel. So how do you know if you're being loved? 
I'll use those four criteria, but it also depends on the kind of love that you're looking for. Eros will certainly be a lot different than phileo, and storge is ultimately going to be consumed by agape. What would someone have to do to prove that they love you? Do you need proof? Maybe you're one of those that says, hey, as long as they say they love me, I believe it, and that settles it. That's great. Good for you. You're a very trusting person. But of course, most people believe that people should be accountable to what they say. I know it's kind of gone out of vogue in today's culture, but you really should be accountable to what you say. If you said you were going to do something, if you said you were going to do X, Y, or Z, then you should do it. So if you say you love someone, what is the evidence? Something is broken in our modern world to the point where we distrust a person so much that we don't even worry about what they say anymore. We just know that it's probably not true, so we'll just protect ourselves. Distrust has become the mode of the day, and here's the reality. Love is best displayed in what you do, not what you say. It's best displayed in what is done. So we finally get to 1 John 4, 9. Yay! Knew we get there eventually. That was the introduction. 1 John 4, 9 says this, In this the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent His only Son into the world so that we might live through Him. The love of God is made known, it is manifested, look at that, in what He did not what he said. John Walvoord says this about this passage, if one wishes to know how God has demonstrated his love, he need only look at the fact that God has sent his one and only son into the world that we might obtain eternal life. He made his love manifest. And and what that means is that his love didn't just spring up out of nowhere and just suddenly become love. His love was always there. It just wasn't clear to us. It was there all along, but now, now, with the advent of Jesus, we see the depth and breadth of it. Now, think of it like our galaxy, right? It's there, and when you look up at the night sky, you see, okay, it must be something big, but it's not really clear how big it really is, right? We we need something else to present alongside it in order for us to fathom how big it is. And I'm thinking of those, you remember that that, uh, YouTube video of where it starts off with the planet Earth sitting out in space and you see this beautiful blue and green rock, right? And then it pans out and puts the Earth, presents the Earth next to the other celestial bodies of our solar system. You know that video, the one that I'm talking about? And, and And it looks tiny next to Jupiter, right? And then it pans out even further, and you can't even see the speck. They have to give you an arrow pointing to where Earth is in relation to the sun because the sun is so much bigger than the Earth. And then it pans out, and the sun is presented next to these other huge celestial uh, star systems. And the sun looks tiny, and eventually it gets to the point where they have to point an arrow to the sun so that you can see that the sun, how big the sun is in relation to these massive stars, right? It takes us looking at something that we understand to understand the scope of how big something really is. Similarly, God's love is like that. It's made manifest. Now, because we see the Son entering into our world and dying for us, now we see what His love really is. But it's been there all along, just like the solar system has been there all along. We need to see His love in relief or contrast with something that we're familiar with. So we know, because many of us have experienced it, we know the love that a parent has for their child. And if it's their only son, I can only presume because I don't have an only son, I had a first son and I knew how great my love was for him. If it is their only son, we presume it is even more so. And that is confirmed in the next paragraph, John says in verse 14, and we have seen and testify that the Father has sent His Son to be the Savior of the world. So we have come to know, verse 16, and to believe that the love, uh, believe the love that God has for us, right? He sent His Son. We've seen the Son of God was actually sent into the world. What's the evidence for that? Well, that's why we studied John first. We just worked our way through John. And we know 
based on John, that the signs were there, that the first 11 chapters of John are all about the signs that Jesus is who he said he was, right? And then we see the testimony of Jesus so that he is who he says he is. And then ultimately we see the power of Jesus displayed as he exhibits his power over his own death. The evidences are proof positive that Jesus is the Son of God. And so 1 John 4, 9 says, he is the only Son of God. God. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent His only Son into the world so that we might live through Him. Now, some of your translations say His only begotten Son. That's fine. This is a common theme within John's writing, John 3.16, John 1.14, etc., etc. It could go on. The word that's used throughout there is monogene. Gunos is to have a child. Mono is singular singular child, right? Monogene, the only born one, the emphasis being that He is the only Son of God. The the coming of Christ is, therefore, a concrete historical revelation of God's love. Concrete. It's done. It's an action. His love, and in this case, 1 John 4, 9, is agape, is self-sacrifice, the seeking of another's good at one's own cost. So there's never been an instance of self-giving that is greater than God's gift of His own Son, nor could there be. Let me give you three evidences to that point. First, He is the monogene, the one and only. Moderns translate that the only begotten. Could Abraham have shown greater fealty to God than by being willing to sacrifice Isaac on that mountain? No, he couldn't have. That was his most important prized loved one. And similarly, God showed his love in the most spectacular display possible by sacrificing his one and only son. Two, it is the atonement, not the incarnation, that is the preeminent manifestation of God's love. If God had just sent His Son and said, hey, go down there, live among the humans, show, us what we're, show the humans what we're like, and then they'll eventually follow us more completely, that would have been not nearly as great as what He ultimately did. That would be kind of a sticky, sweet, sentimentality love. Ah, aren't your efforts cute? You just need a little boost and then you'll be here. That's what that kind of love would be. God has established the truth that the only way to deal with sin was through the shedding of blood. Something had to die for justice to be served for sin. So that's why John says in verse 9, in this way the love of God was made manifest, it was made known. And then in verse 10, he goes on to say, in this is love, not that we have loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the, oh, there's that word, propitiation. Thank you for giving an attempt. Propitiation for our sins. His love wasn't dependent on us. We need to understand that first, right? It didn't depend on us to meet Him halfway. It didn't depend on us to be going in at least in the same moral, ethical direction that He was going in in order for Him to save us. We looked at this back at Romans 5, 8 last week. While we were still sinners, while we were still going in the opposite direction that He was going, Christ died for us. This is not phileo love. He didn't wait for us to come to Him. This is what we're going to look at on Christmas Eve. But when the time was right, He decided that There was needed to be an input for us. The time was right, so He sent His Son to be our propitiation. That means the appeasement of the the uh, the appeasement of justice, the appeasement of wrath for us, putting us wholly right before God. The complete satisfaction. Propitiation is one of those words that I argued against that needs to be struck from our Scripture because nobody understands it. Nobody knows what that word means, but it can't be because there is no other word that gets to the heart of what God did 
for us. It takes a whole sentence for us to say what propitiation is. So, he does it for our sins, not for any other purpose, but so that we might have a relationship, be put back into a relationship with him. He takes the step, not us. So his love isn't sentimental. It it dealt with real problems and did so in a very serious fashion. Three, the beneficiaries of God's love were and are, to this day, undeserving of it because we're unable to do anything about it. We are sinful. We're unable to fix that problem within ourselves. Ephesians 2, 4 and 5, excuse me, Ephesians 2, 1 and 2 says this, and you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked following the course of this world. A person who is dead, I don't know if you're aware of this, can't do anything. Well, they can. They can lay there, right? A person who's dead has no will to do anything. We are dead in our sins. Very intentional word used there. But God, verse 4 says, but God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. His gift was ultimate because of what it accomplished, propitiation. God displayed his love in that he was constant. He didn't give up on humanity. It was constant. He was there all the time. And his love then became made manifest through the advent, through God with us. And even while we were sinners, he stuck with us and Christ died for us. God displayed his love for us in that he was careful. (laughs) He didn't cut us to the quick and say he was only joking or sing a song when our lives were heavy. Instead, he cut himself to the quick and he mourned with us, for us. God displayed his love for us in that he was candid. He told us that we were sinners. He didn't try and cover it over, smooth it over, and say, it'll be okay. He told us that we couldn't save ourselves and that only He could save us, which is the truth. He told us all that we needed to hear. And most importantly, He told us that He loved us. He was candid. And He displayed His love for us and that He gave us wise counsel. Jesus says, get into the yoke with me, my Burden is light. Let me do the heavy lifting because I love you this much. This is what Christmas begins to tell us, that God loves us. He loves us so much that He sent His Son. And I say it begins to tell us this because Christmas is for Easter. Without Easter, Christmas doesn't matter. So how do you respond to true love? His love is free and uncaused and spontaneous, and all our love is but a reflection of His love and a response to it. I think of this in terms of how we respond to love. Are you familiar with the movie The Princess Bride? I've seen it like 492 times, right? The Princess Bride is about Wesley and Buttercup, and Wesley is a farm boy And he serves Buttercup. And Buttercup always is coming up with things for him to do. And Wesley, every time he does it, says, as you wish. And in the story, we hear grandfather quoting this, that she was surprised, Buttercup was surprised to learn that every time Wesley was saying, as you wish, he was really saying, I love you. And what she was even more surprised about was that she loved him back. And then the whole rest of the movie is the fact that Wesley leaves on a journey And his ship is attacked by the dread pirate Roberts. And he disappears. And they have to get back together somehow. But how are they going to do that? Because it's true love. They will, right? And ultimately, Buttercup is taken, you know, she's kidnapped by these, these, you know, conniving people. And they take her away. And they're pursued by this pirate ship. And everybody assumes that's the dread pirate Roberts, right? And ultimately, through all of these machinations, The dread pirate Robert gets Buttercup too. 
And so in their discussion, the Dread Pirate Roberts is trying to find out whether or not Buttercup is really worthy of Wesley's love. And ultimately, he cuts her to the quick, and she's so angry with him that when he turns his back, she pushes him down a hill, right? And as he's rolling and tumbling down this hill, if you remember the scene, his mask flies off, and he says, as you wish. Some of you have, yeah. And she immediately realizes what she's done, and she says, oh, my sweet Wesley. And what does she do? She throws herself down the hill. It's the dumbest scene ever. Ooh, oh, as they're tumbling down this hill, right? Why am I telling you that story? Because the love was not unrequited. The love was pursued in that relationship. God is saying, as you wish, what do we wish? Are we wishing for him to be out of our life? He gives us that. Are we wishing for him to save us? He gives us that. How will you respond to his love? I'm going to call up our worship team as we close out this service today. When you get love, you have it to give. Maybe you understand this. Some, some people are running on empty because nobody loves them, or they don't feel loved, or they don't understand the love that is available to them. 1 John 4.11 says this, Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. With God's help then, and it has to be with His help because He is the source of this love, because of His love for us, we can love each other. We think of Christmas as being this great loving holiday. (laughs) Without God's love, we're really unable to do anything worthwhile in it. But if we have His love, then we display that constancy, that dependability to those around us. We're careful in what we say and how we say it. We're candid with each other. We tell each other what we need to hear in that careful way. And we give the counsel that really matters. And what really matters is how you respond to God's love. Will you choose to respond to it? We say Christmas is all about peace, love, joy, hope. All of those things are bound up in the gift of God's one and only Son for you who died. Even though you weren't going in the same direction He was going, He died for you. Will we follow that love or will we strike out on our own, looking for something else because it seems too good to be true? I pray that if you haven't made a decision to be embraced by that love, that you make that decision today because He loves you so much that He died for you. Will you stand as we close in prayer this morning? Lord Jesus, we thank you so much. We thank you for the fact that you loved us so much, that you gave up your spot. You willingly gave up all of the privilege and glory of heaven. You humbled yourself and you put yourself on a cross. Nobody else put you there. You did that for us. You chose it for us. Lord, may we constantly live out of that great love. May it fill us so that we can fill others. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Away in a manger, no crib for a bed. The little Lord Jesus laid down his sweet head. The stars in the sky looked down where he lay. The little Lord Jesus asleep on the hay. The baby awakes, but little Lord Jesus, no crying he makes. I love the Lord Jesus, look down from the sky and stay by my cradle till morning is nigh. Jesus, 
I ask thee to stay close by me forever and love me, I pray. Bless all the dear children in thy tender care and then fit us for heaven to live with thee love of Jesus. Have a wonderful Sunday. We'll see you on Christmas Eve.